Welcome to Open Heaven Inspiration. This is Mike Gast. Thanks again for joining me. Hope you all had a blessed week. I'm going to take a couple minutes here to praise the Lord. Hope you join with me. I can feel you flowing through me, Holy Spirit, come and fill me up, come and fill me up. Love and mercy fill my senses. I am thirsty for your presence, Lord. Come and fill me up. Lord, let your mercy wash away all of my sin. me completely with your love once again I need you I want you I love your presence I need you I want you I Spirit overflow. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us overflowing. Fill us with your spirit overflow. Hallelujah. Isn't God good? I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. So, well, praise the Lord. So last week, uh, we were talking about uh, dealing with the pre- with uh, acceptance and rejection. And I'm going to add something to this so um, my, my uh, video doesn't get taken out here. Um, okay, praise God. So um, last week we were discussing acceptance and rejection. And I'm going to recap just a little bit of what I shared Um, Even though we are accepted and loved by God, literally the Bible says we are accepted in the beloved. God does not accept everything that we offer to him. And that was was the main thing that we were on last week. You know, Hebrews 6.1 says, uh, encourages us to repent of dead works 
And many times people think of dead works as sinful behavior. And I believe it includes that, but I also believe that it includes unfruitful service. And um, it could be things that we that have that maybe bore fruit in a former season, but are not bearing fruit in the season that we're in. And by the way, great to see you, Bonnie. If Delbert's there, even better. Always great to have your support. Um, to, and to give you an example, uh, I've, I've been leading worship in different venues for many years, and I remember in one venue, I did the worship and I spoke. And back at that time, I would play guitar sometimes, or I would sing with tracks. And at that time, the greater anointing was on the tracks. This is literally what happened. I started off the worship set playing my guitar and singing. And, as, and while I was doing that, everybody was sitting down. I did, I can't remember one song like that, maybe two at the most. And then I put on a track. As soon as I started singing with the track, everybody got out of their chairs. Now, the cloud has moved since then. And today, if I was in the same venue and I was singing with a track, I think they'd be sitting down. Not that the people's response is everything, but they would probably not get as much out of it as they would get out of what I'm doing today because I'm, I've repented because I'm flowing with the Holy Spirit. You know, the scripture says it's so important for us to stay current with what God is doing on this earth what he's, and what he's doing in our lives. That's why Galatians 5.25, it says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So that's uh, going from glory to glory, knowing what God wants uh, from us and how we can serve him best. You know, I am, as a musician, uh, there's something that I was trained with. It's called a metronome. And um, I don't have one with me to show you, but... Um, a metronome is a timekeeping device, and uh, musicians that are trained with those, they absolutely love to work with them because it, it helps you. Sometimes when you're playing something difficult, you tend to, you get nervous and you try to play it too fast, which makes it even more difficult. So to me, the sound of a metronome is so pleasant that I can practice for a half an hour and leave it on for two hours. Um, but I bring that up to say this, the Holy Spirit is like our metronome in the, in, as we offer our praise, our life sacrifice to him. The Holy Spirit is like our metronome and he helps us to keep pace with, with his will and his ways in our life. And it's great to see you as well, Phyllis. Thank you for your support. So last week, I talked about a little bit about Elijah and the, the challenge he made against the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And I just want to touch on that quickly. Um, I shared it in a post recently, if you didn't see this, or especially if you're on YouTube. Um, but, but when Elijah, when they did this challenge, they were in a time of great controversy and uh, at just the time of great controversy and dispute, not unlike the times that we're living in. Now, as I shared last week, the sacrifice that was offered by the prophets of Baal was rejected by God for obvious reasons. But the sacrifice that Elijah offered was so pleasing that it was consumed by his fire, by the fire of God. And we all know as I shared last week, and if you're a student of the Bible, that this was such a convicting sign that it caused the people who had been halting between two opinions to believe again and return to him. And as we offer our lives as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him, which is our reasonable service, and might I add, how, how could anything be less, re, less than reasonable when we consider the price that was paid for us to be reconciled with God and to walk in fellowship with him. Jesus offered the ultimate sacrifice. So for us to offer our lives on this earth 
is certainly reasonable, as the scripture says. But, but when he accepts that sacrifice that we offer to him with our lives, we'll be consumed with the fire of God that'll make us a sign both to the, the unbelievers and to believers who are saying, help my unbelief. And how many of you have ever been there, uh, like the man that had the son who was epileptic, when Jesus said, do you believe? He said, to me, this is one of the most poignant passages in the entire Bible. The man said, I believe, help my unbelief. So, so we can be a sign to those who are weak in their faith. And we also, as we are consumed by the fire of God, we become like the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. And, and I'm not going to read that passage today. I, I possibly uh, should have shared it, but I'll just take you back to it simply. Mo when Moses was in the desert, he saw a sign, and it was a burning bush that the Scripture says was not consumed. In ancient times, and especially in that place in the world, there was such a dry climate that for a bush to catch on fire, that in and of itself was not unusual. But what was unusual was that it burned and it kept on burning. And, and, and I believe that for our lives, and so he turned aside and he had an encounter with God as a result. And the Bible actually says that an angel appeared to him in the flame of that bush. But when we are in step with the Spirit of God that lives inside of us, we'll be consumed by his holy fire. So it's one thing for us to have moments when we shine for God, and those are great. Those are times for rejoicing. But it's another thing for us to have the longevity, the stick with itness to continue to go from glory to glory. So, so we, are, we burn and we continue to burn. So when I believe in divine encounters, and, and actually I'm an extrovert, so I just love to meet new people. But when it's a divine encounter is when in some way, shape, or fashion, we know that, it's, that there's something, that there's a divine element and that we've encountered with God had an encounter with God when we met with that, that person in some special way. So today, I'd like to step forward and talk a little bit about the acceptance and praise of man. The acceptance and praise of God is the foundation for this whole discussion, and, and as I get into it, you'll see why. Proverbs 27, verse 21, it says, fire tests the purity of silver and gold, but a person is tested by the praise they receive. Now, the scripture has many accounts of people who receive praise and the results of that test. One person I think about is Haman in the book of Esther. Um, Mordecai, Mordecai was the uncle of Esther, and, and I'm, I'm not going to share everything, but he was the uncle of Esther, who was a, a, a Jewess that, that married King Ahasuerus. And Mordecai was in the courts of the king. Now, there was a certain man who, of Amalekite origin who was uh, promoted during that time. And wherever he would go, everybody would bow to him except for Hey, except for Mordecai, and Mordecai refused to do this because he was an Amalekite, and the Amalekites were abhorrent in God's eyes because they had opposed the Israelites on their way to the promised land. They had opposed them pretty ferociously. So, so he was exalted, and because of his pride, it was him and his friends couldn't stand the fact that Haman a Jewish, that Mordecai, a Jewish man, would not bow to Haman. So they set up a scheme not only to murder Mordecai, but to murder all the Jewish people throughout every province of Persia. Little did Haman know 
that he was making this assault against the very apple of God's eye. So in, so as, as all of this progressed, uh, Mordecai became aware of a plot against the king, and he reported it, and that his, the information was true, and the king's life was spared. But no honor was given to Mordecai until we get into uh, Esther chapter 6. Um, after the plot had been set up for all the Jews to be, to be killed, a mass genocide, the king was up one night, couldn't sleep, and he had the recorders just, um, some of his officials just read some, some office records to him, basically. And at that time, he discovered that Mordecai had never been honored for what he did. And so when he discovered this, Haman was in the courts and he said, he called Haman into his presence. And, and the king asked him, what shall be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? Now, Haman thought in his heart, <laughs> in his prideful place, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? I say more than moi. And Haman answered the king, for the man whom the king's delight to honor, let a royal robe be brought which the king has worn, and a horse on which the king has ridden, which has a royal crest placed on its head. Then let this robe and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor, then parade him on horseback throughout the city square and proclaim him, for thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then the king said to Haman, hurry, take the robe and the horse you've suggested and do so for Mordecai the Jew who sits with the, within the king's gate. Leave nothing undone of all that you have spoken. So Haman took the robe and the horse, and he did as the king said. Now, as the, as the story tells, this was the beginning of the end. This was the beginning of the undoing of Haman. Now, that I think what I want to bring out of this story, though, so first of all, Haman failed the test of man's praise. That, that crucible of praise showed that he wasn't fit. He wasn't really ready for that position, and he failed in a, it failed in a great way. Um, but the other thing from this story is that it shows that even though Mordecai was not honored when he saved the king, the honor came later. And that's where it was almost like he saved the king in secret. But Jesus said in Matthew 6, 4, that what is done in secret will be rewarded openly. And in Galatians 6, 9, it, uh, Paul said, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we faint not. And I want to encourage everyone who's listening now and everyone who listens on the replay, have you sowed your life to the Lord? Have you sowed your life to serve others? If you have not received that honor, that promotion yet, promotion is coming. Your due season will come if you will faint not. Another, there's another person in Scripture who was tested by praise, and this was King Saul. King Saul, we know, was a, was a rather insecure king. He accomplished much in his time, and he recognized David, who became a great warrior in his army. And, in, and I'm going to read this passage to you. In, in 1 Samuel 18, it says, So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely, and Saul sent him to rule over the men of war. And he was accepted in the sight of all the people, 
and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now it happened as they were coming home, when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Then Saul was angry, and the saying displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can, can we have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed him uh, jealously from that day forward. And, and you know, what's, what's really key here is that it was God that put Saul in as king. And Saul, if, if you know the story, Saul was killed in battle. And he was ultimately, over a process of time, he was replaced by David. But Saul did not lose his kingship because of David's success. He lost his kingship because he was disobedient to God, who had put him, who had made him king in the first place. So this is another man who wasn't ready. He didn't pass the test of praise. And again, this was a test of praise because Saul was being acknowledged for his thousands. Saul was acknowledged as the king, but he became insecure when someone else received a higher level of praise. Now, there's another test of praise that, that people can deal with, and I call this misinterpreted praise. Gary Chapman wrote a fantastic book many years ago called The Five Love Languages. And essentially, um, actually he's written several versions of it for, for singles, for married, for children. He also wrote a version for the business world called The Five Languages of Affirmation. But these five languages are words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts, acts of service, phys and physical touch. So uh, what he found in his studies, it, it, he, he had a couple, he had been counseling couples and early in his ministry, he counseled a, a struggling couple and he gave, him, gave them this task. He said, for the next 30 days, I want you to say a, one kind word to each other every day. So they, you know, they left, they, they followed his directions. And, and when he saw them the next month, the husband was elated. He was just so happy. But the wife was just as miserable as she had been before. And that led him on the path to see in that particular situation, one of that man, that man's primary love language was words of affirmation, but that was not the primary or even the secondary love language of his wife. And so even though he was attempting to show her love, he wasn't communicating uh, his love to her, you know, and he wasn't expressing it in a way that she could process and that she could understand. And that's typically our, our, our primary love language and our secondary love language it's the way that we are affirmed, and it's the way that we affirm others until we learn uh, better ways to, to affirm. And there are even dialects. So I'm not going to get into all of this, but, but this is what I want to say to you, is that when it comes to, uh, obviously, as I mentioned, this is for all kinds of settings. But just because, but, but, but here's what it comes down to, is that not everybody knows your love language. Not everybody knows your language of affirmation. And we do, we do need praise. We do need pats on the back once in a while. But many times, people don't express it in a way that we take as love or affirmation. And so, and so we miss that. And it's important for us to have a full love tank. Um, if if, if you want to call it an affirmation tank, it's important to have that in relationships. 
because a person that has a full love tank can give more. Whether again, with the business world, they feel affirmed, or whether it's a team and a friendship, the, the more affirmed you can, you can, make, it, you can make, make each other feel, the more you can give. So I wanna say this too, when it comes to our, our languages of affirmation, we need to learn that if somebody might very well be telling you, you did a great job, but they're just not telling, but we have to learn to be multilingual and understand different ways that people express things to us. Now, the, the good thing about all of this um, is that God knows your love language. He knows your primary love language. He knows your secondary love language. And we didn't talk about dialects, but he even knows your dialect. So God knows how to love you. Now, um, and so, you know, I, I want to give you an example about receiving affirmation from God versus man. There's a gas station in a town where I used to live that went out of business. And for a long time, their sign said zero. So when you drove by, it looked like somebody was selling gas for free. And I, I can imagine, I know that would always catch my eye. But once I figured out they were, that they were out of business, okay, I moved on. But the reason I share that is that I never pulled into that gas station because I knew that if I needed to get gas in my tank, that was the wrong place to go. And let's face it, sometimes we look for love and affirmation in the wrong places. Ultimately, we should be, we should be looking to God. And I'm going to get to that some more. But there are some people that just don't know how to affirm others. There's some people that just don't have that, that gift or that desire. And then there's other people that, that just delight in honoring one another. So we can, we can pay to know where to receive that pat on the back when we need that pat on the back. Now, something else that I think is important here when it comes to the praise of man is that not everybody who praises and affirms us really means it. And not everybody who's quiet does not appreciate us. Uh, John chapter 12, verse 42 says, many people did believe in him. That's Christ. However, in, however including some of the Jewish leaders. So some of the top echelon believed in Jesus but they wouldn't admit it for fear that the Pharisees would expel them from the synagogue. So, so we know that Jesus had a lot of discernment and sensitivity to the hearts of men, but there were more on his side than, than appeared to the eye. And I remember when I was in school uh, at Purdue, there was this place called the Green where people liked to go and study. And it was a great place to witness and to share your faith. So one, one great afternoon, I was sharing my faith with uh, another student man and uh, uh, with a male student. And as I was sharing it with him, there was a young lady in our earshot and, and I could feel her spirit. She was pulling on me. She was listening to every word that I said even though she wasn't um, necessarily looking my way. I could feel it. She was kind of looking in the direction. But long and short of it is that I encouraged her to get involved in the discussion. But when I did, she dropped her head into her book. She hid in her book because there are many like those in, in the time of Jesus that they... They might believe in the gospel. They might really want to know about it, but they're ashamed of it. They're ashamed of what men would say. And as I've mentioned on this broadcast, I, I enjoy, I, that's something that uh, um, uh, a calling and a gifting that God has put on me is to share my faith in the marketplace. But there's times when I'm hot and there's times that I'm cold. 
I remember going through a season a few years ago where I was, I was seeing opportunities. W when you share your faith in the marketplace, you're always looking for opportunities. And the more doors you walk into, the more doors open. But I went through a season when the doors would open and I didn't walk in. And I was seeking the Lord about what was going wrong. And he spoke to me very simply that I had become ashamed of the gospel. I repented of that and got back into my place that God wanted me in the marketplace. And I've said this many times, we're all wired for different things. Not everybody is going to be as strong in one ministry than the other, but this is simply an example. And I like what Paul said, but, it, but if I'm talking to you, if you're that extrovert and, and you sense that pull, Paul said, Romans chapter one, verse 16, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Now, when it comes to witnessing, I know we're on a little bit of a tangent, but I just want to share this with you. I believe in the laws of sowing and reaping in so many areas of our Christian walk that we that maybe have not ventured to apply it. But how many of you have someone in your life, whether it's a loved one or a, or a friend, that you've, you really would like to see them come to Christ, but you can't seem to get through to them? Because let's face it, sometimes family are more difficult. How, how about if we start witnessing to others that God brings into our life one way or another? If we witness to the ones that someone else can't get through to, isn't it enough for us to believe that God would send somebody to minister to the ones in our lives that we can't get to? That's the law of sowing and reaping when it comes to personal evangelism. As I mentioned before, I think a foundational scripture in this study has been Romans 12.1 that we're to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. And I was thinking about that word living the other day, and that something is living. Something that would be offered in an altar in the ancient times was something that was not just alive, but it was healthy. And I believe that the lives that we offer to God we should, we should strive to be emotionally healthy and balanced. And that's why understanding, acceptance, and rejection comes into play. See, to be a great servant for the Lord, we have to be free from unhealthy attitudes about acceptance and rejection. And it's the great servants that make great leaders, which leads me to really, I believe the bottom line of this broadcast, and that is these, these five or six words, it's not about you. I'm going to let that sink in for a moment. This is a Selah moment. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, and whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not to men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. So first of all, this scripture says that whatever we do to do it heartily, heartily has to do with our attitudes, to do it generously, to do it in excellence, to do it from a heart of love to God and others. But then it says to do it as unto the Lord. And I believe that that is so key. When we do an act of service or kindness for a, say a church, um, a friend, an organization, any person, we should be doing it as unto the Lord. And when that's our heart attitude, whether we receive the reward or the response from that person that we hope to receive, is not that important because we know that God will reward us. So 
I'll ask you a question. Have you served a friend? Have you served in a friendship, in a marriage, in an organization where that relationship has ended? If it ended unpleasantly, if it ended in a way that you didn't want to see it go, here's the question. Did you do that as unto the Lord? If you did it as unto the Lord, you will receive your reward from God, from God Almighty. And I'd like to give an example here. So let's say that you are, let's say that you join a church and and for years before you joined that church, you were excellent at receiving offerings. And I have to tell you, some people are really good at receiving offerings. I remember visiting a church one time where the pastor told a story. He had an evangelist that came to his church and asked if he could receive the offering. Now, this pastor hesitated a little bit because this pastor happened to be very gifted when it came to receiving offerings. Um, he had, he had shared, shared with his church and seen some really big offerings come in right when they need it, but he said, okay. So as the plate was being passed around, the, the, it, it went to every person, and the evangelist said to the people, he said, I want you to pass the plate around one more time, but this time, if anybody has a need, if you have a bill that you can't pay, any kind of financial need, I want you to take what you need. Now, at that point, the pastor got nervous, but it ended up being the biggest offering they had ever received in that church. Now, I just shared that story. That was for free. But, but let's say that you're one of those people that's excellent at receiving offerings, and your church appoints someone who's never done it before. So you being the kind person that you are, you mention to the person if you ever need any advice, I've got experience with this. And they say, no, thank you. So what will your response be? If it's truly not about you, then it won't turn into rejection. I think about Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your very great reward. I pull several things out of this scripture. First of all, when God told Abram that he was his shield, having keeping our focus on God shields us from feelings of rejection. And, and it keeps us above the emotional storm clouds that can take place when we feel rejected but also we don't lose the vision in our lives because, again, Abram saw this in a vision. When our vision is correctly adjusted and we know it's unto him, we won't lose hope. But ultimately, God told Abram, who had just done some exploits for God that made him vulnerable, that he was his shield and his very great reward. If you're listening right now and you can say this out loud, I want you to say this with me. God is my shield and he is my very great reward. Amen. Romans 12.1 says, Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. That just goes along with, with our heart towards God and man. When we delight in honoring each other, if somebody gets in the spotlight and you're on the backstage, that's okay because you know that your reward is with God. Proverbs 8, 6, 18, 16 says that a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. Now, I'm going to... I, what I don't see in this scripture is that others make room for us and others bring us before great men. I believe that a lot of you that listen to this broadcast are ministry-minded people. 
and would love to see your platform expanded. But ultimately, it's going to be God that makes room for you in, in, in newer levels, in greater places of influence. And it's going to be God who brings you before those people with favor. Now, I want to tell a story about a, a story about rejection. Okay, so some years ago, I felt like the Lord wanted to advance me in my career, and I knew that it wasn't going to happen at the company where I was serving. And so, um, I started to look for another position, and. I started to look for another position and I had lots of interviews and I would get first interviews, second interviews, third interviews, but I kept getting no's. I kept, but it didn't stop me because I had a vision for where God wanted to take me. And after a couple of months of this, I finally got the offer, and that offer paid substantially more than any of the other positions we're talking about, and it was a much better opportunity. So in the long run, I, it, when, I, when I finally got to that company, I said, thank you, God, for all those no's. I wanted to send, I ought to send a letter to all those places and say, Thank you so much for that kind rejection letter. If you had not said no, I would not be where I am right now. And I heard an, another story of a man that when he, was, when he was young and desiring marriage, that he proposed to four women that rejected his proposal before he met the woman who finally said yes. And in the years that, that, um, the years that transpired, the Lord orchestrated, um, orchestrated contact between him and all those ladies who had said no. And, and unfortunately, when he saw where they had gone in life, he was so thankful that they had said no and that the woman that he was with had said yes. So I share that because this was a man whose his, his, uh, his heart was right for marriage. And God honored that by closing all the wrong doors and opening the right door. We're all familiar with this scripture, but uh, Proverbs 3, 5, it says to trust in the Lord with all your heart and to lean not on your own understanding that in all our ways acknowledge, which means to honor him, and he will direct our paths. So no matter what it looks like to you, let's honor God through the thick and through the thin. Now, when I lead worship, I, I like the, I think that people get a lot out of examples. And so, um, so hopefully this, this will help you uh, with, with what I want to convey tonight. But when I lead worship, I like it when the audience responds. Uh, maybe it's a wave of a hand. It could be a shout, a shout of joy. Um, if there are dancers in that, in that service um, or a flag wavers to see the movement, I like it because it, it's, it's one indicator that I'm on track with the anointing. Um, and also, many times, responses from people, I've noticed, uh, uh, anointed people, that their, um, that their responses actually increase the level of anointing in the atmosphere. But one time, and, and so, it's not as, so it's not so much a, pray, a, a pat on the back as it's letting me know it's confirmation that I'm moving in the right direction. But I remember one time at my church, there was a, there's a very prominent minister that um, when she would, she didn't wave her hand or, or do that for just anybody. 
but she did when the anointing was really there and it would increase the level. Well, I noticed that she stopped doing it and put a little question in my mind. But, and it went that way for a couple of weeks. So the question was answered one day when she stood up to address, address the congregation. And when she stood, I noticed that she was wincing. It was clear to me that she was having some kind of a physical difficulty with her, her, her back or something like that. So ultimately, she wasn't raising her hand because she couldn't. Now, if I was completely, you know, looking for man's praise, I could have been lost over that. But that's just an example. Um, because my worship, and, and I believe that yours is, uh, is should our worship, our service should ultimately be to God. So um, regardless of how the audience responds, and again, I'm, I'm going to throw this in, when I go to different places, sometimes the culture is more reserved than others. I, so, re, uh, so regardless of how they respond, I keep my eyes on the Lord. And, you know, again, another to me, a bottom line statement is that um, when it comes to any kind of ministry, say it's on social media, you could have a million followers. You could have 30,000 people watch every broadcast, but ultimately, God forbid, if you are on a sick bed or if your heart was broken because of a, something going on in your life, people are limited in what they can do. But it's God that could, but only God can heal someone of an incurable disease. Only God can heal things in our life. So the praises of men only goes so far. That's why I keep my eyes on the Lord. And something else about ministry is that even in ministry, results can be misleading. Let me explain. In Numbers chapter 20, Moses struck the rock and Moses was commanded to speak to a rock because the Israelites were in a place where there was no water and they were very thirsty. And if you're familiar with the scripture, the Lord instructed him to speak to the rock, but because he had anger, because he had not dealt with, with his mouth. Now, I'm getting off on a tangent, but, but bear with me. At the beginning of Moses' ministry, God had asked him to go to the Israelites, but he said that he was a man of unclean lips. Some believe that he had a stammer or a stutter. And, and, and finally, and, but God told him, he said, I can help you with your mouth. But he kept saying, no, I, I can't do it. I'm not qualified. And so finally God sent Aaron, even though that was not God's choice. So God tried to help him with his mouth at the beginning of his ministry. And we all have areas where we really need help. But because that was an undealt with area, when it came to num this situation in Numbers chapter 20, that undealt area caught up with him. So instead of speaking to the rock, he struck the rock. He struck the rock and there was a miracle. The water gushed out and, and Israel was rescued once again. But because of that undealt area in his life and because of his disobedience, Moses was, uh, was denied access to the promised land. So even results can be elusive. I, there's a minister that I followed that shared a story one time and he that was similar to that. He he went to a church and this particular service there was just an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There were miracles, signs and wonders. And so the next time he went there, he the, the crowd was all revved up and they were expecting the same thing again. But the Lord had dealt with him to take the service in a different direction. Well, this time he gave in to the crowd 
and, and he went with what they wanted. And there were miracles. There were healings. But after the service, he was really convicted in his heart that God had wanted to do an even deeper work in that place. So he knew that he had grieved the Lord. So ultimately, we have to, we have to keep our focus on God. We need to do what he wants. No, it's not about us and that it's all about him. So that's my broadcast for today. I do have an ask for you uh, on this broadcast. And um, what I want to share is, um, is about sowing and reaping. Now, I'm not asking for financial help. What I'm asking for is simply for your reactions, your likes, your comments, your shares. When you do this because of the algorithm in Facebook, it will get this broadcast out to more people. And I believe that if you'll do this, or if, if God directs you to assist this ministry in another way, that's great. But I believe the scripture says, Luke chapter 6, verse 38, give and it will be given to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. Will men put into your bosom? For with the same measure that you use, it'll be measured back to you. So if you, you're getting blessed by this ministry, I encourage you just to give back in those simple ways. Now, we think of giving to God and Him giving back to us overflowing, but you know that you can give unto a ministry and receive back from that ministry as well. Now, there's some of you right now, I see, I see that you're doing great things to help me get the word out, but this is for some folks that maybe aren't doing that. There's a ministry that I, I supported for many years. It was World Challenge uh, under David Wilkerson. And uh, I would get his newsletters every three weeks, and it was just like manna from heaven. And something I would do once a year because of their outreach to uh, hungry people and, and you know, uh, challenged people all around the world is I would send a financial gift. One year, I did not, one year as I was getting ready to send that gift, I had a thought go through my mind that this was such a big ministry that they probably didn't need my offering this year. So unfortunately, I went with that thought. And in the weeks to come, I would get those letters in the mail that used to be so rich and so nourishing, like honestly, like Anthony Jones' messages that, I, that um, I'm so blessed by. But I would get those letters, I would open them, and they would do nothing for me. What had used to be a river became a desert. So they just started to stack up. And, and this went on for several months. And one day, a light came on that I had not supported that ministry the way that the Holy Spirit told me to. So I got out a check and, and I did as the Lord told me to do. And do you know that I went back to some of those same messages that had been stacking up in my office and all of a sudden, it was like the, it was like the river had come back. I couldn't stop reading them. I had tapes from that ministry that um, some of the tapes I didn't enjoy as much, and they were good to put me to sleep. <laughs> so uh, that's the secret between me and everybody on the internet now. But when I would put those same tapes in after this, they weren't boring to me anymore. They would keep me up all night because they were so exciting. So my point to you is this. If this ministry has blessed you, uh, if you can help me get the word out to people uh, through your, your likes, your comments, your shares. I believe that you'll be even more blessed by this ministry. That's my broadcast for tonight. Thank you so much again for, for joining me. And until next week, let's remember that it's not about us. Let's do everything 
as unto the Lord. Let's remember, let's not faint or grow weary so that, so that we won't miss out on the rewards, the blessing, the promotion that God has for us as obedient servants of the Lord. See you next week. Have a blessed week.